If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pause the video and reread the question before listening on. In order to determine the forces on the beam due to support one and support two, we're going to need to draw a free body diagram showing the forces that are acting on the beam. Now, perhaps the most obvious force is the weight force of the gymnast pressing down on the beam. So we're going to draw a gravitational or weight force pressing down on the beam, and we're going to symbolize that by using lowercase m times g. Now, the beam itself has weight. The mass is given, and therefore it will also have a gravitational force. We're going to call that gravitational force capital MG. In addition, we have these supports pressing up on the beam in order to prevent it from accelerating downward. We can call this force acting at support 1, F sub 1, and then the force acting at support 2, F sub 2. So those are the four forces acting on the beam. Our next step is to label some distances on the beam. So let's go ahead and do that. Now the distances illustrated in the picture are given directly in the problem. You might want to pause the video and just make sure that you can understand where those distances came from. We have the length of the beam is 5 meters, and then the distance of each support to the end of the beam was 0.54 meters. So now we have all the forces and the distances accurately labeled. Our next step is to select a pivot point because we're going to be applying the principles of torque to solve this question. Now when you select a pivot point, you want to select the pivot at a location on the beam where a unknown force is passing. Now the unknown forces in this question are F1 and F2, so we could place the pivot either at this point right here or we could place it at this point right here because at either of those points we have an unknown force passing through that point. Now we will choose to place the pivot at the location marked on the screen and the reason that we want to put the pivot at a location where there's an unknown force is because that unknown force won't actually produce any torque as it passes through that point. So in this case, where we've located the pivot, F2 is going to produce zero torque. So we're going to exclude it from our torque analysis. Now, torque, you may recall from an earlier chapter, is equal to a distance R multiplied by the force multiplied by the sine of the angle between R and the force. So we'll talk about that as we proceed, but another review item we might want to touch on is that if a force produces torque in a clockwise direction, that's going to be considered negative torque, and if a force produces torque in a counterclockwise direction, that is going to be considered a positive torque. So with some of these ideas in mind, let's take a look at the torque produced by F1. Now, F1 would have an R value as follows. What you do is you measure the distance from the pivot all the way to where that force is applied. So in this case, that would be this distance right here. We could call that R1. You might want to pause the video and ask yourself, well, what is the value of that R1? Well, basically, it would be the length of the beam minus this end chopped off, if you want to imagine it that way, also minus that end chopped off. So in other words, what you're going to want to do is take the five meters subtract off one end of the beam and then subtract off the other end of the beam as well. And when you do that, you will get a distance of 3.92 meters. We might as well go ahead and label that on our diagram. So to set up the torque of F1, what we'll do is take F1, we will multiply it by that distance as just described, that was 3.92 meters, and then we're going to multiply by the sine of an angle. And the angle is going to be between that orange R vector and that black F1 vector. So if you look at that angle, you can see that it is indeed 90 degrees. And then you also want to determine if this is clockwise versus counterclockwise torque. This can be a little bit tricky, but just try to imagine F1 pushing up on the beam and remember that the beam is pivoted at that orange that orange point. So if you press up on the beam and pivot it at that orange point, the beam would have a tendency to rotate in the clockwise direction. So that will be negative torque. And then in addition, the sine of 90 is just 1. So we can actually omit that term from our equation. So that's the torque supplied by F1. Let's move on to the next torque. We're going to add that. The next torque we could examine is the torque produced by capital MG. Now, in order to determine the torque 
produced by capital MG, we're going to need to know this distance right here. So we draw a vector from the pivot point over to the MG force. We might just call that R2 for now. We need to figure out what that distance is. Now, capital MG force is acting at the center of mass of the beam, which is located in the geometric center of the beam. So this distance from the MG force all the way to the right end of the beam would just be half of the length of the beam, so that would be two and a half meters. Now again, you might want to pause the video here and see if you can figure out what this orange distance is right here, the distance that we've labeled R2. Hopefully you can see that it would be the two and a half meters minus the 0.54 meters. So if we make that subtraction, we get about 1.96 meters. That's going to be the distance that we've labeled R2. So to set up the torque of the capital MG force, we're going to take capital MG, which is the force, we're going to multiply it by that distance, which is 1.96 meters, and then multiply that by the sine of the angle between that orange R2 vector and the black MG vector, but that angle is 90 degrees, just like it was before, and the sine of 90 is 1. Now, capital MG is pressing down on the beam, and if you press down on the beam and it's pivoted at that orange point, that's going to cause the beam to go in a counterclockwise direction. So that's going to be positive torque, so we'll keep the plus sign in our equation. So we can move on to the third torque. Remember, F2 produces no torque, so we can disregard that for now. And we can move on to the lowercase mg force. Now, for lowercase mg, we would draw our R vector from the pivot point over to where the force is located. Perhaps we can call that R3. And in that case, you can see that the distance R3 is just the distance from that support to the end of the beam. And that was that 0.54 meters. So for the distance, we'll use that. Here we go with the force. It's lowercase mg multiplied by the distance of 0.54 meters. And then again, the angle here between R3 and the force vector is 90. So sine of 90 is one, we can omit that. Ask yourself whether this is positive or negative torque. Hopefully you can see that as the gymnast's weight presses down at the right end of the beam, that would cause the beam to rotate in a clockwise orientation. So that is going to be negative torque. So we'll make sure that we put a negative sign here. Now, the sum of these three torques must equal zero because the beam is in equilibrium. So we'll make sure we set this equal to zero. Now we can go back and retrieve the values of uppercase M and lowercase M. Uppercase M was the mass of the beam. That was 250 kilograms. Lowercase M is 46 kilograms. So we're gonna plug those values into our equation along with the value of G, which of course is 9.8 meters per second squared. So we filled in the values stated. We've omitted units just for the sake of clarity. What you might want to do next is pick up your calculator and punch all of that into the calculator at the same time. When you do that, you're going to get about 4,559. And on the other side, we have the negative F1 times 3.92. This is all set equal to zero. You could subtract the 4559 and then divide both, both sides by negative 3.92. And when you do that, you're going to get a force F1 equal to approximately 1,163. This is a force, so it will be measured in Newtons. So that's the correct answer to part A of the question. And in part B, we're going to figure out what the F2 force is. That was the force exerted by support number two. And we can do that using torque, but we can also do that using Newton's second law, which advises us to sum the forces in the y direction. So let's take a look at the forces again. There they are. And if we recall that the beam is in equilibrium, then we can say that the sum of these forces acting in the y direction is going to equal zero newtons. So the upward forces can be assigned positive and the downward forces can be negative. So looking at this simplified free body diagram, we would have F1 plus F2 and then minus big mg minus little mg, set that equal to zero. Let's add the two mg forces to the other side and then subtract F1. So we would have F2 equals mg plus mg and then minus the F1 force. And we can go ahead and plug in all the known values. Again, we've omitted units for the sake of clarity and F2, when you put that into your calculator, turns out to be about 1,738 newtons. That is indeed the correct answer to part B of the question.